some people were surprised that you would accept my invitation. So first thing I want to say is that thank you very much for accepting my invitation, sir. It's a, it's a big honor to have you here. And, uh, you know, there's uh, no grudges in sports and politics. And I got to tell you, I love your career, sir. I love your service to the country. And I, I couldn't be prouder than I am right now to share the stage with you. So I just want to say thank you. Thank, thanks for the offer. And uh, what, what, a lot, <laughs> what a lot of people don't know is uh, uh, since then we've kind of developed a friendship and uh, I appreciate the offer to be here. Oh, it's, it's, Any it's, opportunity I can get to, to talk about uh, some of the experiences I've had uh, in the military or otherwise is, is worthwhile to me. So I want to I want to start with that, sir. I think it, I think it's important because we had a great conversation in my office. Uh, tell tell people here for those of you that don't know you super well. How did you grow up? Where did you grow up? What inspired you to go into the Marine Corps? How did things well, start? Well, I grew up in, in uh, the city of Boston. Um, in um, back in those days, neighborhoods were everything. So the neighborhood I was in was uh, solidly Irish Catholic. Now. As they said back in those days, I don't know if it's politically correct anymore, I am the product of a mixed marriage. My mother was Italian. <laughs> uh, <laughs> and so... Uh, so half of them actually loves me, okay? I just want to state the record, okay? <laughs> uh, my dad worked two working-class jobs. He left the, you know, left the house every morning at 5 a.m. and got home at midnight for 45 years. But you were, you were in Brighton, right? You were in the Austin Brighton, area? Okay, Brighton, so, Austin, yeah. So for those of people that don't know really Boston and the surrounding areas, Brighton is blue-collar neighborhood predominantly back then, right? Ba back then, was, it was nothing but blue-collar. Uh, you know, and, and, and back then, again, everyone in my life all the men in my life were uh, World War II vets or Korean War vets. Uh, at the time, we had something called the draft. And um, the Vietnam War was going on when I reached the age of 18. So uh, typically, guys from my neighborhood, or back in those days, you waited for your draft uh, notice if you weren't you know, trying to get a deferment or make an argument about not going in the service. You waited for your draft notice, went down. Uh, I took the, my draft physical in the same uh, place that federal building that my father and his brothers did for World War II, uh, and it's still in, 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 uh, in use. Anyways, took the draft notice, uh, passed it, and in my neighborhood, very kind of Marine-centric, uh, joined the Marine Corps. And uh, like, you know, I think everyone that goes in the service, you don't really ever think about making it a career. Um, in my case, like everyone that ever went to Paris Island, South Carolina, you, that first day, that first few minutes, you realize you've made the biggest mistake of your life. <laughs> um, but in spite of the fact it was a, a different Marine Corps back then, and the, and the armed forces was not very well thought of, unlike it is today. Uh, so to, just for time spread, what, what year was that? 1970. So, right, so it was right in the middle of sort of like the Vietnam right. era. Kent State had happened already. Right. I know yep. we just saw the 49th. Yep anniversary of that. And, um, and uh, so anyways, went to, but really the people were, people are everything anyways. And the people that I met, I made, I was a private, made sergeant. The, uh, the individuals, the young officers in my company were encouraging me to become an officer. Uh, I had to get a, a degree to do that. So I, I was in a program, get out of, uh, get off of active duty, uh, went back to Boston to work. Uh, and go to school, get a degree, and in 1976 got commissioned to second lieutenant. Once again, I didn't think it would last all that long, and it lasted uh, right at about 45 years. Yeah, so, 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 so explain that to all of us. You, you were deployed, combat deployment, uh, you re-enlisted, re and what caused psychologically the series of re-enlistment for you? Well, um, again, the, I, I, as I would tell people, my, my spouse, my wife, uh, and my kids, I'll stay as long as it's meaningful and fun, and it was for 45 years. It's, uh, I miss it, um, I miss the people, but uh, you know, and, and it's, it's hardships to say the least. I mean, we moved 29 times, you know, of my three children. Uh, two of them went to, I think, three different high schools. One of them went to two different high schools, uh, moved cross oceans, cross country. Uh, the, the military wife, spouse, is a phenomenal human being, uh, strong like you wouldn't believe. Uh, so without my wife Karen, I couldn't have done it. Without my three kids, I couldn't have done it. Uh, but you give up a lot. But it's a big service, a big sacrifice for the country. Um, it's uh, September 11th, 2001.
Tell us where you were. Tell us what you were thinking about. Tell us uh, well, was, the aftermath of that and subsequent. Uh, yeah, I'd just come back from a tour in Europe at NATO. I was in Camp Lejeune, North Carolina, a colonel. I was the operations officer for the 2nd Marine Division. Not that it means very much to any people here, but uh, one of the guys uh, that worked for me came in my office and said, sir, turn the TV on. An airplane just hit uh, one of the skyscrapers in, in New York City. And I remembered that I think in the 1930s, a plane hit the Empire State Building. So I said, I don't know, what's, what's the weather like? And, and we turned the airplane and there, I mean, we turned the TV on and it was broad. I mean, it was obviously a beautiful day uh, weather-wise. And I said, well, it's got to be, there's got to be more to this. And then bang, the second one happened. And that basically changed my life in the sense, in my family's life, so for the next decade or so, we were so wrapped up in the wars in, in Iraq and Afghanistan that we were almost either going or coming. At one point, all three, my two sons were both Marines uh, and, and myself, we were all three in the combat zone. You know, again, and my wife back in uh, Camp Pendleton, California, taking care of thousands of young wives whose, or spouses, uh, mostly wives whose families had to deployed. Yep. You're, you're, you're one of the first, you, you are the first colonel to get promoted to Brigadier General since 1951. Explain to us the, the process of that. And yeah. that, was, that took place in a combat situation. Is that so, not correct? Yeah, some of the, some of the historians told me that. Um, I'm, I'm assuming it's close to true. But um, I got, uh, I was the number two in the 1st Marine Division. I was a one star. Jim Mattis, former sure. Secretary of Defense, was um, the two star division commander. And um, I, uh, I think it was two days after we invaded from Kuwait into Iraq, and uh, at, the, at, at the, you know, the battalion so or the division command post, I got promoted. So this is sort of March of 2003? Yeah, it's two, uh, two days after we invaded. Yeah. Okay. Uh, we were all in NBC, nuclear biological chemical gear, gas masks, um, and uh, we were in a small part of the CP com command post. Anyways, it was a very small ceremony and it was artillery fire going out and artillery fire coming in. So it was kind of a, a dramatic moment. You, 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 you said something back then, which I think is worth repeating. You, you, a reporter asked you about the potential difficulty of defeating Saddam's army. And you remember what you said? Yeah, Tony Perry from the LA Times, who was one of the in embedded reporters, uh, were, was standing there with me. And you know, the artillery's firing, the rockets are going. Marine aviation, or you know, aircraft, fighter aircraft, are dropping bombs all over the place, and um, not all over the place on targets, and um, very specific targets. See, um, I picked he, up he that did, all over the place. He did work for President time. Trump, yeah. you know that, right? So the, <laughs> that could have came out of the idioms of that experience. And, and I'd known Tony Perry a bit uh, before that uh, in, in, in previous deployments, <laughs> and Tony said to me. Uh, there was only two divisions attacking, one, well, three. One U.S. Marine, one U.S. Army, one United Kingdom. And uh, a lot of us didn't think that gave us a lot of flexibility. But so he said, the, you know, the Iraqi army is so much bigger than you are, than, than your organization. Had you ever thought in your life uh, that you might actually be defeated, that you might not be able to pull us off? I thought about it for a, a, a nanosecond, and I said, I said, now these, and, and, and the, the Marines are f going through and in tanks and everything else. And I said, no, these are, these are U.S. Marines, Tony. Uh, you know, they held Guadalcanal. They took Iwo Jima. Baghdad ain't shit. And uh, so that went down. And, <laughs> um, and he actually printed that. So when my wife told me I ought not to say those words. <laughs> That's happened to me with my wife, right. General. I can uh, guarantee that. So, so you're, I'm, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna to fast forward. Um, uh, you're with President Trump. You're, dis you're discussing the uh, war in Afghanistan, the potentiality of withdrawing troops. Um, and, you know, it's been reported that you push back against the withdrawal of troops and also the uh, potential withdrawal of troops from Syria. So can you take us into your thought process there, if you don't yeah. mind? And, uh, some of the things you were thinking I think about the best way, and why. I think it's important yeah, for people to understand. The best way to answer that is if you, if you know what a chief of staff does, and I'd been chief of staff uh, more or less a couple of times in my military t career, to include for, uh, for Robert Gates. Can you, can you tell me what a communications director does too? Because <laughs> I know 
Or you don't know. No, I don't know. But maybe, <laughs> maybe backstage you can tell me what it is. All right, but you're, you're, you're with them and, and you're... And, um, so, I mean, the President of the United States is, is the Commander-in-Chief. He's obviously the Chief Executive. Uh, he was elected by uh, the American people. Um, he was elected on an agenda that he talked about, whether you, whether you like his agenda, whether you like him, love him, hate him, voted for him, not. Uh, he is the President of the United States. At that point, when he becomes President, it's in every American's interest to hope he succeeds. Amen. You can still degree, uh, disagree with him on his uh, policies and whether he tweets or not or whatever, but what he deserves at that point as the President of the United States is the best staffing that human beings can possibly provide. So uh, the, the, one of our first discussions was certainly about Afghanistan, uh, and I, I, I didn't push back. What I said was, let's, let's initiate a process by which we bring the right people in to have a full and lively discussion on this. That happened at Camp David, sir? Or? Actually, the first, uh, the first uh, people I brought in, Mike Pompeo, who had CIA, he brought uh, some other CIA experts in. The station chief from Kabul came, and we had a discussion about uh, how the war is going from the paramilitary point of view, the, the CIA point of view, and, and obviously the intelligence. And then uh, and H.R. McMaster, who was National Security Advisor, of course, was there, the president. And we had that discussion. And then the next uh, individual we, we brought in with his team was uh, the Secretary of State. Again, the conversation about what would happen if we withdrew from Afghanistan or Iraq or both. And then uh, the Department of Defense, how things are going. And uh, from that lively discussion um, that I never really gave my opinion on, the President of the United States decided that he was going to change the strategy a bit, tweak it, and remain in Afghanistan. And uh, Ed, that was his decision. Add troops at that time, or they were still? Remember, we added some troops. Yeah, you added about 4,000, yeah. but right. I mean, did that happen at that time? Or yeah, that, that was, was a second? decision at that time. At that time. Um, so Do you agree with that decision, sir? I did. Yeah. Yeah. But the role of a chief of staff uh, if, is, is to make sure the individual, the principal, in this case the president, is well-staffed, well-informed, has the right kind of people to come in uh, and, and help him make those decisions. He's the ultimate decision maker. And then afterwards, of course, uh, I was responsible for making sure those decisions were implemented. And that, again, another part of the role of a chief of staff is, you know, at the end of the day, or at the end of the meeting, I'm typically the last one there, and uh, would, would query the president, uh, you know, are you, are you where you need to be on this one? Or he'd ask me, what do you think? Um, but the role of a chief of staff is to make sure the president makes the most informed decisions, and that's what I did for 18 months. And so, Syria, uh, your view there was to keep troops there as well. Is that fair to say? Well, in Syria, we were, very close. Remember the caliphate uh, that, that stretched between mm -hmm. Iraq and, uh, and Syria? Mm -hmm. um, that caliphate uh, was about the size of the United Kingdom uh, when it was at its heyday and working primarily with uh, Iraqi troops, um, free Syrian troops, Kurds, um, with American air power, advice, uh, intelligence, uh, destroyed the caliphate. Uh, and that happened mostly, mostly under President Trump's watch. He should be, he should take the credit for it. Um, but as he's looking at Syria, that, how much longer? Does that make us safer? The average American that would ask oh, yeah. that question. Yeah? It, and why does that make us safer? Sir? Well, it's important for people. Yeah, it makes us safer. First of all, the first place it makes very safe, much safer is uh, Europe because of the proximity. But what we don't want in the world is to have, much as it was just prior to 9-11, is for the terrorists to have a place, a safe haven, to organize themselves and then launch attacks from, which is what uh, uh, the uh, Al-Qaeda did for 9-11. Uh, so we want to keep them on the run. We certainly don't want them to establish a caliphate or a, or a nation state, uh, which they had done. And uh, as I said, to his credit, uh, the president unleashed the, uh, the US military in, in, in in U.S. Uh, intelligence establishment in a way to support the people who are the, actually doing the fighting. Um, completely eliminated, almost eliminated? Where do you think we are now in terms of that fight? 
Well, I think, you know, again, the, the caliphate's gone, but the, the, the very tiny percentage of people who follow uh, Islam who are terrorists uh, have gone back to their old ways, and that is a very decentralized uh, effort. Um, so where are they now? They're all over Africa. We're, we're engaged with local African partners to fight them. Obviously, they're still in the Middle East. They're in uh, places like the Philippines. They're in places in, in, you know, in that part of the world. Our intelligence is incredible. We provide the fighters of those countries, those, those governments, the information to go after them, and periodically we take care of business ourselves. You, you, uh, you accepted the job um, at the end of 2016 to be the Department of Homeland Security right. uh, cabinet member. And uh, had you met President Trump prior to that? Or, or did Just you twice. meet him during the process of that? Or when, when, yeah, when did I mean, you get to know the president? It was, after the, it, was, it was in November after the election. I'd never met Mr. Trump before in my life. I uh, got a call from uh, his, it was a transition, got a call, would you, would you come up and talk to him about uh, taking a cabinet position? Uh, they didn't tell me which one. I, uh, uh, I drove up to Bedminster the next day, met with the president-elect for a better part of an hour. There were a couple other people in the room. Uh, but a week later, I was asked to go up to uh, Trump Tower and uh, have a second meeting. That's when he offered DHS. Uh, Jim Mattis had already been offered DOD. And I would tell you, I didn't know an awful lot about DHS, but what a bunch of people, what an organization. Very, it was a great job. Uh, you know, DOD plays the away game, and they do it very, very effectively overseas, um, killing terrorists and, and that kind of thing. But DHS plays the home game and they're just as effective as, as in, in the home fight as DOD is in the away fight. A remarkable group of men and women who just are really superb uh, Americans. Um, you, so you, you, you take the job, now you begin the process, and uh, illegal immigration in the United States drops. Right. By how much? Uh, maybe half. Yeah. And yeah. That, that contributes to the employment situation in the U.S. too. You know, what I mean, that's one of the things, right? It, it took the slack out of the labor supply, and it probably also helped to raise wages in certain areas. Uh, I don't know enough to comment on that, but, you know, the reason it went down, I mean, Mr. Trump used to give me a lot of credit for it. The reason it went down was the, the, the individuals who are coming here spend, in their world, all of their savings to get here. They, they pay these traffickers, and they didn't know what was going on in the United States. They'd heard what Mr. Trump was saying in the election. Um, before they turned over their life savings to the traffickers, they took a pause to watch and see what was happening in mm -hmm. the United States. So you had the illegal immigration go down. Now it's up like it has never been before. But for a similar, the reason now is they believe, they believe that he is going to seal the border. So they want to get in before that happens. So both of it has been, uh, as a result of Mr. Trump, the, the campaigning caused them to be very hesitant to spend all of their money, so they waited. Now they're coming in droves because they think he will be able to secure the border. So there's a lot of disinformation out there, sir, about the you know the child separation policy and a lot of the things that took place. And uh, um, can you just elaborate? I think it's important for people to really understand what happened, how it's happened, and uh, you know what the outcome is and what we're doing. Because uh, I, I think I think it's just important for people. Yeah. One of the things that the White House staff does for the president, obviously, is inform and, and all of that kind of thing that I've already described, but also to manage what we say is the interagency discussions on any issue. Uh, our government's huge. Uh, any decision will affect multiple parts of our government. Um, so if, if the Department of Defense comes in and says, we want to do this, that might be the absolute worst thing from the Department of Commerce's point of view. Uh, in the case of, um, in the case of uh, immigration, clearly the world knows, certainly our country knows, what Mr. Trump's view is on securing the border and in, in trying to secure our country from, from uh, all sorts of malign influences. Um, so as he was pressuring, which he, that's what he does, he's the chief executive, pressuring the government to make decisions uh, sub subcomponents of the government to make decisions. And this is a case where a, a decision was made before we staffed it. So Jeff Sessions, who's a very, very good friend of mine, uh, he was here today, he's a, he's a great American. He made a decision 
uh, that to, the zero tolerance decision. It's, it's his authority to do that at DOJ. Uh, that had immediate impact. So define zero tolerance for some people that may it, not know exactly. Essentially, that. zero tolerance was if you come here, we are going to deport you. Uh, and if need be, we are going to separate. There's, there's a Flores agreement that goes back 20 years. It was very valid 20 years, 30 years, I guess now. Very valid back then, and that was that you could not keep uh, children uh, defined by anyone under the age of 18. Uh, with or without their families, you can't keep them in, um, in confinement more than 20 days. Uh, it was a, uh, back in those days, you could go through the deportation process within 20 days and have people going back to their home countries. It's very different now because of the backlog. It takes 40, 50, 60 days now to uh, go through the process because illegal immigrants have rights. Uh, they get to see lawyers. They, get, they have to go before immigration judges, and it takes time. So do you, do you think we've sort of corrected this situation now? Or no, it, it needs to be corrected okay. um, to extend the period of time uh, for that process. Because at the end of the day, the vast majority, 90%, I think, of people do not get to stay. Some people do, but, it, but we need more time to, to process. So, so Jeff Sessions makes that decision, has immediate impact on DHS, who does the actual policing on the border, and then they turn the families, particularly the children, over to Health and Human Services. Uh, and neither one of those two organizations were not ready. Uh, they were surprised by the decision or by the uh, statement. And then on top of that, to prepare the American public through the communications channels to make them understand what was about to happen. That's why you need to have a process in the White House to take care of all of that interagency coordination ultimately go to the president and say, this is what we're going to do with your permission, sir. This is how we're going to deal with it. HHS is ready. DHS is ready. We've got a great comms plan to explain to the American people what's going to, what's going to happen. That did not happen. And uh, it, you know, it didn't go well. Um, there's another aspect that I, if I could get into for a second, there's another Please. group that comes up from Latin America, not Latin, just Latin America, but they're what's called unaccompanied minors. The families pay the, uh, the uh, traffickers to take their child below the age of 18, to take their child to the border. And th this is a horrific trip. I mean, there's so much sexual abuse, there's so much physical abuse, uh, but again, they pay the traffickers to take the, the children up here uh, once they get across into our country, they then look for someone to turn themselves into because they cannot be deported without the, without the family's permission. Uh, other things like that, but generally they cannot be uh, deported. The families know that. So what do you do with the children that come up? It takes about 60 days for the Health, health and Human Services to find a suitable home for them to live in here in the United States. They have to be vetted, the homes, naturally. You don't want to deliver one of these children into an unvetted home. Uh, some of them have relatives here. We still, you know, HHS still has to vet that, even though it's an uncle or an aunt or a sister, to make sure that you're putting a child into a, into a decent uh, place. During that roughly 60 days it takes to do that, they're, they're held in, uh, in, in places. First thing they do when they get there, is their, their hygiene needs are taken care of, clean clothes, this kind of thing. They're all given medical, immediate medical exam, exams. Uh, the young women, young ladies are given uh, pregnancy tests. They immediately start school, six hours of school a day. Um, and then uh, at the end of the roughly 60 day period, once they're vetted, they have a place to send them to, then a member of HHS takes them by aircraft or bus or whatever, or automobile, depending on the distance and takes them to the home. So, and there's a lot of misinformation on that too. These kids are not uh, in these detention facilities. It's f purely for humanitarian purposes. Um, I just wanted to get that out there. I think, I think it's important. And, and, and if you had to make a few suggestions on things that we could do to improve that situation, what, what would some of those suggestions Well, I mean, it's, it's, it's frankly, the, the, the laws have got to be, just a few laws need to be changed. Um, and, you know, I would, uh, when I would go and testify at Congress, the, you know, certain people in, in the, on, the, in, on the committees would beat me up about why are you doing that? 
And you say, because it's the law. Yeah, but we don't agree with you doing that. Yeah, but you're, let, me, let me explain to you, Senator, Congressman, whatever. I'm in the business of enforcing the law. It's against the law for me not to enforce the law. You're in the business, call me crazy, of making the laws or changing the laws. So why don't you do your goddamn job and, and change the law? Well, in the meantime, you. we've got to go according to the law. Do you like politics or is it a fun job? No, in politics? no, no. It's, it's very it sucks, right? So, I mean, <laughs> that's one thing you and I can totally agree on, right? It completely sucks, right? So, so how do you? It's a necessary evil in our democracy. Ne necessarily. <laughs> so how do you how do you think the uh, your appointment as chief of staff played out in your mind? Like, how would you describe it to people? Well, I mean, it's uh, as I've as I've said, it's a, it was a very hard job. Um, but I would also tell you, it's the most important thing I've ever done in my life. Um, as hard as as my predecessor, Reince Priebus, uh, tried to do what I was success, I built on what Reince did. Um, but I would tell you, for the 18 months I was there, I don't know in detail what it was like before I was there, uh, other than it was, it was not quite as organized, I guess is one way to put it. And I don't know what it's like now. But when I was there, um, the President of the United States was well staffed, and when he needed to make a decision, he had all of the information he needed to make uh, the decision, and then, of course, I'd follow through with the execution of the decision. While I was there, hugely important. So how would you characterize your uh, relationship with the president? I think it, uh, I mean, I think it was a good, good relationship. I mean, obviously, he's the chief executive. I was a subordinate. Um, we had, uh, you know, the one thing that, well, anyone that works for anyone else, I mean, I would imagine in the business community as well, you don't want lackeys and yes men below you. You want, when you ask a question of someone... You, you don't strike me as that, sir. I'm no. just giving the heads up, okay? You know, but when you pretty ask, good at evaluating. But when you ask someone in your organization for their opinion, if they don't give you an honest opinion, you can't make, you know, a, you know an informed decision. Uh, Do you so, think this president's receptive to honest opinions? He was when I was there. Um, he didn't, you know, we didn't all, I didn't always agree with him, and he didn't. But again, uh, when he would say, what do you think, I'd tell him what I thought. Uh, m my conversations with him, like any chief of staff, is typically one-on-one uh, -on -one or one in a very smaller group. But again, I'm not the expert. I mean, I, I can hold my own talking about military operations, international relations, that kind of thing. Uh, I tell you, a very fascinating part of the job for me was being involved in things I didn't know a lot about, business, taxes, tariffs, uh, to sit there and listen, you know, to bring union members in, or union leaders, and to talk about the impact of what was being contemplated on working men and women, to bring in then the captains of industry, so to speak, to find out what they were, what their view was, members of Congress in. Uh, to, to issues that I didn't know an awful lot about. That was fascinating for me. Um, there were times, obviously, that where you were able to shape the president's um, strategy or help him shape or influence his policy de decisions. Can you take us through an example of that or just stylistically how you were capable of being successful in doing that? Well, I think, as I say, the, the Afghanistan would, would be, that was the first one, and certainly how I did business um, the, is, was to bring in the right people um, and, uh, and have, a, to say the least, a lively conversation. And uh, the president's a kind of a show-me guy. He's like, you know, convince me. I, I don't agree with you. Convince me. Um, and over time, relatively short period of time, I was able to read the president's uh, well enough to say, you know, sir, let me bring in some other people. Let me bring some people from the Hill in. Because both sides, you know, so whatever the issue, you, you could find people that were, were dead set against what he was contemplating on, on Capitol Hill and absolutely, you know, in line with what he was thinking. But that's the role of a, a chief of staff. So let's, let's talk about Twitter for Twitter. a second. Yeah. Um, Do you ever provide him feedback on his uh, Twitter use? He would I, I have unsuccessfully, <laughs> by the way. I just want to state that for the record. But I just think. No, here, here again, you go back to people uh, have said, well, you never controlled him. It's not my job uh, when I was there. You control the President of the United States? I mean, 
Now, he would sometimes, and they'd say, you know, you never get him to stop using Twitter. I never tried to get him to stop using Twitter. He would, he would ask me periodically, hey, did you see that Twitter thing I sent out? What'd you think? <laughs> Usually uh, when it was very bad, he yeah. would ask me that. <laughs> I'd say, that you know, okay, you've made my life more complicated than it had to be today, but, but, but in well, I, his thinking uh, is, uh, and you've heard him say this, I mean, nothing I'm saying here is, is uh, anything that you hadn't read somewhere. Um, his thinking is that he is not, whether you agree with this or not, he believes, and he has stated it many, many, many times, that he's not given a fair shake by the press, and so the Twitter process allows him to go above the press, around the press, to get his message out, his rationale, his justification for doing things. Um, that's his belief. And that's, uh, you know, and he, he, was, <laughs> he, did it, and he did it a lot. Um, and sometimes you liked it, and sometimes you probably didn't like it, right? Yeah. But, it, but I think it was... That was him, and he was going to do that one way or the other. Isn't that yeah, fair to say? Exactly I right. I thought we found that it was true on the campaign. One of the things I did find, though, if he had a ton of media advocacy, he seemed to be more strategic. When he, when he felt like he was had to go out there and defend himself, then yeah. started shooting off bombs yeah. just to go off. Um, you know, the mainstream media, um, when you first got the job, they portrayed you as this sort of patriot that was yeah. coming in to serve and to, quote, unquote, protect the country from President Trump. Um, is that that, how you, that was an unfair characterization. Yeah, was that how you approached the job? No. Yeah, tell, 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 no, us, tell us the truth. It's the, the president, he's the elected president of the United States, ran on an agenda, and he's in the, in the process of, of attempting to execute that agenda. My role, any staffer's role, was to help him do that, to give him advice, uh, to bring in, as I've already described. Um, I had an interesting conversation. I used to do off the records um, when I first took over as chief of staff, unfortunately, and I look, I, I believe in the press. It's a, it's an essential part of our, me too, uh, of our of our democracy. Uh, right now, I think uh, for a lot of different reasons, uh, re depending on the outlet, they've taken sides either for or against uh, the president, for or against some of his policies. Um, I, I wish that could be set back to where they would be more. Uh, journalistic integrity as opposed to kind of some of the agenda driven stuff but but I believe in the press and I never missed an opportunity to tell members of the press to include here uh, for the last couple of days that I I believe in, in the press um, but I did have uh, one of them tell me probably six eight weeks after I was at the White House that uh, in a discussion that uh, you know you were our worst nightmare now, this person was not speaking for all the press, but there were more than one press person in the room. Um, she was speaking for herself, but she said, you know, you're, you were kind of the worst nightmare. Plug and leaks, right? It's that why, right? Yeah. yeah. You were kind of the worst nightmare because since you've been here, um, you've put some process and order to the process. The president, from our view, uh, is better uh, informed on issues so we can make decisions. You are you were our worst night, our worst nightmare. Right, because you're stopping them from getting all those leaks that were coming. All out the leaks and just and she said we you didn't think that uh, this would be anywhere nearly as successful as it has been. So you know, Chief of Staff Kelly, you, you got to go. And but, then they would. It's interesting because you. I mean, I hope you don't mind me sharing this because no. you, you said it in my office. Uh, there were probably like 1,000 or 1,200 articles that were written about you. Once they figured out that you were in a position to stop the leaks, they were rushing out yeah. stories to... Uh, one of my staff people, I, I said, how many articles have, have been printed relative to something negative about me? And um, I was shocked. He said, well, about, uh, about 1,000. <laughs> now, a lot of them were, were, were based on... Uh, what I found was a lot of times with the, with the press, you know, if you... If you, the first story might be, and it, not just about me in general, the first story, say the Washington Post writes a story and they, they caveat everything by saying, you know, our, our uh, source says. So they don't report it as fact. Right. They'll report it. But all the subsequent, uh, most, an awful lot of the subsequent reporting by other outlets on that first article tend to write it as fact. 
And sometimes I would go, if I could, just to finish that thought, go yeah, and, sure. and say to the individual that you know, wrote it, I said, look, come on, you know, you know that, I mean, how many sources did you have for that one? You know that's not, well, I have a source, one source, and, and you know, for, for a story that big, you had one source, come on. Um, and so, their response was? Uh, I, gotta, I gotta write so many stories, but, but again, uh, with very few exceptions, I, I, I like my relationship with the press, I, I stopped doing the off the records because again, they weren't off the record. Uh, understand they had a job to do, but, uh, and they were overwhelmingly good folks. You think the president is a stable genius? I, I, mean, I wouldn't pass judgment on, on either one of those. I mean, he's a, he's, he's a smart guy. <laughs> he's, he's a smart man. He's an accomplished man. He uh, feels very, very strongly that he ran uh, on an agenda, and he's trying to follow through the agenda, which is kind of well, unique I, for a politician. I, I always find, well, I guess I'm from New York, and when he says he's a stable genius, I used to get a kick out of that. He always, that was like a Molotov cocktail he was throwing at the press just to get him upset, <laughs> yeah, right? Right, you, right, right? You saw him do that, yeah, yeah, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know? yeah. Um, tell us your, your opinion of the Mueller investigation, if you don't mind. Do you think it, it came out sort of the way you thought it would? What's, well, your, it, what's your opinion there? Did you? Yeah, I stayed for uh, a lot of different reasons completely out of the Mueller investigation. The, all of the issues that were being discussed, although I was interviewed, but all of the issues that made up the Mueller investigation happened before I got there, either in the campaign or um, in, in those first six months before I got there. Uh, when I got there, uh, that was an ongoing investigation. Uh, the president had personal attorneys, uh, and I was very... Uh, uh, aggressive in, in keeping out of it and also making sure that the White House staff didn't get wrapped, if they, didn't, if they weren't already involved in it, not to get wrapped up in it. It was something that was going to run its course, obviously. Uh, we had the business of the people of the United States to accomplish. And so, uh, again, I can only uh, tell you what I've, what I've read in the paper myself. Did it, did it turn out sort of the way you expected it to or any surprises there? Or? Well, you know, again, uh, the president, to say the least, denied any, uh, any involvement in, in some of the accusations. Um, I thought when the Mueller investigation first came out that had put a, an, an end to it, but I guess in the, in, the, uh, in the atmosphere that we have in Washington, in, you know, the, what's the old expression, if you get 10 lawyers in a room and ask them their opinion on a topic, you'll get 15 uh, opinions. <laughs> So I, so, I mean, it's got to go through the courts you think, now, I guess. Yeah, you, you've been serving the American people and you've been part of the American government for four decades. Do you think that this is sort of polemical environment is hurting the American people? I know it's a leading question, but like, what can we do to fix it, sir? Well, I, I mean, it seems over the last, you know, several years for sure, I mean, Americans used to be able to who cares about the politicians? Amer Americans used to be able to disagree with each other and not hate each other. Uh, Republicans, Democrats. Now it seems if you disagree with me, I, you know, I hope your mother dies of stage four cancer or something. <laughs> and uh, we've got to get to a point where, I mean, when you, if you, if you think since Mr., I mean, if you look since Mr. Trump has been president, there are actually consultants, uh, consultants now that when you're going to go home for Christmas or Hanukkah holiday uh, and you're a Trump supporter or a Trump hater, uh, they will help you deal with how to sit at the Thanksgiving <laughs> dinner and not, you know. It's like a, are, col yeah. like a college course, right? So we've, we've got to get beyond it. I, I'm, I'm, I, and I think our, our elected officials have got to understand that they're not, they are in fact elected to represent the people of the United States. Uh, and yes, you were elected to be, say, a Democrat from from one state or a Republican from another state, but the whole thing is based on talking to each other in compromise. And if you don't do that, then nothing's gonna happen. So, so what are our, our biggest threats? That's one of our threats, right? That we're fighting with each other, so we right. have an internal threat of our discourse. Right. What do you think our, our outside external geopolitical threats are, sir? Well, you know, we get, uh, we get China obviously is, is a concern. I mean, they've been on a pretty steady 35, 40 years uh, program to uh, not only uh, become very, very economically developed, 
but also military. And, and you know, they, they, they take the long view. You know, our, in, the, in the U.S. government, we look about two years out, you know, election to election. Um, you know, they, the Chinese have been on, uh, you know, probably a 50-year, 50, a 50 um, maybe a 100-year program. When you, talk, when you see what the Chinese are talking about now, you don't ever hear them say 2020. You hear them say, you know, 2040, 2060. Um, so they're, they're a competitor, not an enemy. Um, you have uh, Russia that has its own internal problems, but any country that has, uh, you know, that many nuclear weapons you have to be concerned about. North Korea is, a, is an issue right now. North Korea, uh, by all reports, cannot hurt the United States with uh, nuclear weapons. But um, at the same time, they, they, I mean, they've stopped developing an ICBM, but who knows how long that'll last. You know, one of the things the president, and I, again, you've, you've seen him talk about this, is that everything in the past that we've tried to use, say, in North Korea is the best example. You know, we've been, we've been trying to work things the old way for 70 years since the end of the Korean War. It hasn't worked. He's a, as you know, you know him well enough, he's a guy that likes to have a personal connection. So, yes, he wants to have a one-on-one -on -one relationship and feels as though if he can develop a personal relationship with some of these folks, that uh, conflict is less likely. If there is a crisis, they can pick the phone up and talk to each other. Um, Do you think it'll work out the way he thinks? Probably not exactly the way he thinks, but I mean, I, I, God knows it's always better to talk than it is to fight. Almost always better to talk than it is to fight. And I'd add in there the Iranian issue. They are a malign influence in, in, in uh, that, certainly that part of the world. And uh, this concern that they could develop, again, nuclear weapons and you know, that changes the equation. You, you think the president will win a second term? I, I think he will. I think given the, uh, you know, this, this seems like there's a, well, you, you never know. I mean, I don't know. There's, there's multiple people running on the Democratic side. If they pick the right person, I think they can give the president a run for his money, but I think he will win a second term. And how do you think um, history is going to judge the uh, Trump presidency, sir, and your role in the Trump presidency? Well, I think if it's fair, and of course, we won't know for 25 years. You know, I get uh, a lot of queries, mostly from people that, well, always people writing, writing books, oftentimes from the press, and they say, you know, we, we want to write a history of the Trump administration. Would you work with us? And if you're writing in, uh, trying to write a history of something that's happening, that's not history, that's a, that's a report or an article. Um, I think in, in, if they're fair, my 18 months of serving the president, who happened to be Donald Trump, was that he was served well uh, by the staff. And on very, very important decisions, he was well-staffed, well-informed. And again, whether you like him or not, whether you like his decisions or not, uh, when I was there, they were informed decisions. You got a couple minutes left. There's a lot of young people that come to Salt. We bring a lot of uh, yeah. fellows and uh, you've, uh, You've had this very distinguished career, fascinating career. Um, any advice for those young people before we walk off stage? My advice to all Americans is get involved. Um, one, of the, one of the great things about serving a nation, and I would say in, in law enforcement, in, in, in the military, uh, uh, intel professionals, they, they get this naturally, but an awful lot of Americans just live their lives and don't kind of get that sense of, so just get involved in your communities. I would just, just a quick story, the light's flashing, but when I was at DHS, I went and met with uh, several hundred uh, uh, volunteer firemen and first re firefighters and first responders. And um, uh, most people don't know, but most of the first responders and firefighters in our country are not paid, they're volunteers, 80 something percent. But as I was talking to them, uh, and that takes a lot of time because they have to, you know, the, most people are working pretty hard and, and they give time up uh, a day or two or three a month to be volunteer firemen. And uh, I said to them, just, uh, I don't know what caused me to do this. I said, but how many of you, just out of curiosity, several hundred people, how many of you served in the military? And about three quarters of them raised their hand. All right. How many of you are Boy Scout, Girl Scout leaders? About three quarters of them. How many of you are active in your churches? Three quarters of them. How many of you 
Um, how many of you um, coach soccer or, or Little League? Three quarters of them. So there's, there's, a, there's a group of people in our country who are constantly serving the nation at, uh, at their own expense, if you will. And I would just offer uh, to young people in particular, you don't have to join the military, although uh, I'd encourage you to take a look at that, but certainly get involved in your neighborhood. Get involved in your country. Vote, for God's sakes. Every, every, be an informed voter, and, uh, but that's what I'd, advice I would give. I have to tell you, sir, it's an honor to share the stage with you. Okay? It's a big honor for me, and I know these people really Thanks, enjoyed Anthony. it. Thank appreciate you. It. I really appreciate it. Ladies and gentlemen, General Kelly.